Well, good evening. We're in Revelation, it's the 17th chapter. John's vision to the church. But I want to take a moment and I want you to think about God and his relationship with his people. And as you think about his relationship to his people, you think about the Old Testament and how often God referred to his people as prostitutes and harlots. And he begins to teach his people. And there's one place in the Old Testament in particular that comes to mind when you think about using that reference and God wanting to teach his people. So mark your place and go with me to Hosea. In chapter 1 in Hosea, I'm going to give you a moment to find Hosea. Right? Everybody knows where Hosea is. We know a little bit about Hosea, right? Everybody remember the story of Hosea? I want you to look at it. Hosea chapter 1. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea. That's verse 1. Gives you his names, gives you the kings, and it comes down to verse 2. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer. That's a dead giveaway, right? Marry somebody named Gomer. And she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. So we know the story that he took her to wife and it wasn't long that she did what? She left, right? And what did God tell him to do? Go get her. And so he would do what? He'd go get her. He's a good husband. He'd go get her. He was a God-fearing man. He'd go get her. And so he was married to what we would call a harlot and in some sense a prostitute. Well, a prostitute is different from a harlot. A prostitute does things for finances. In the lineage of Christ, there was a prostitute. What was her name? Rahab, the prostitute. So now go with me with that thought to Revelation 17. And let's talk about the great prostitute. And when you turn there, there are some thoughts as you're turning I want you to think about. Throughout the ages, it has been thought that certain people were the Antichrist. Nero. During his time, the church thought this must be the Antichrist. I mean, he was terrible. He, he would put Christians in camel skins and leopard skins, animal skins, wrap them in wax, set them up in the garden, and use them for candles and torches at night to light his garden and have parties while they burn. It's pretty rough stuff. Well, you fast forward to the 20th century and in the 1930s and 40s, we begin to think that maybe Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. Destroying churches in Europe, killed six million Jews, trying to eliminate God's people in that sense. And people began to think, well, this nut must be the Antichrist. And throughout history, there were many, many others. Antichrist. So what I want you to understand as we go back and people thought it was certain different ones, it's really not a person as much as it is a system. Antichrist is a system and 
throughout the study of Revelation, we've seen that it is two different parts of the system. There is the world religion that is a system of antichrist. It is a prostituting system and world government. It is also a prostituting system. And you see a lot of that going on today as we hear rumors of people taking billions of dollars from the government, prostituting themselves for power. And so we begin to see such things as prostitution in this world system of religion and government. So throughout the ages we see that. We see this going on. Notice what it says as we read the verses. Then one of the seven angels, chapter 17, 1 through 6, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, me being John, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth commit fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Well, that's rough, isn't it? When you read that passage of Scripture you begin to, to see a, a person or a system that is out of control. It is a system. And it is in com completely out of control. And I, I want you to think about what we see in our world today and how out of control our world has actually become. A world system out of control. When you look at verse 5, you begin to see the name, I want you to catch hold of this, the name of the world religion, mystery. Mystery. There's a lot of supernatural stuff in a, a religious setting. It's demonic. Yet it's still a mystery to mankind. We're going to worship something. Put inside of man, indwelled in man, is a desire to worship something, so we worship. Every man is going to worship something. All men, everywhere, will worship. Religious, religions come together in this world system to work against Christ, to work against God, and therefore it is anti-Christ. Now let me try to pull that little statement together. We live in a world where every religion that we're looking at today, and understand I don't believe Christianity is religion. I believe it is truth. I believe it is who we are. We are the followers of Christ. We are not some religion. We are truth. We are worshiping truth. But everything else outside of Christianity is what we call religions. Hindu religion. Islam religion. Mormon religion. And you begin to pile them together and they all work together. And there are some some people that call themselves Christians that form some sort of sex of religion and they work together and, and this is what they say, we're all trying to get to the same place. Well, we're not. Because, because I'm trying to get to the place where only the blood of Jesus Christ will take me. I'm trying to get to the place where only the cross of Christ 
can get me. And the only way to get to the place that I'm trying to go is by the blood of Jesus Christ that was paid for my sins on the cross on Calvary's hill. That's the only way to get there. And all these other religions have come together and they work against that. Because they say it's okay, you can do whatever you want to, whatever makes you feel good, worship any way you want to, we're all trying to get to the same place. That's a lie. And it is against Christ. Therefore, the system is anti-Christ. And it's alive and well. Alive and well. Antichrist. The passage that we're looking at deals with the destruction of the foul world religion. When you get through chapter 16, judgment is over. There's no more judgment. How do I know? Well, because I've studied. Okay? When you read chapter 16, you get to verse 16 of chapter 16, they gathered them together at a place uh, called in Hebrew Armageddon. Then you go through the, the last 17 through 21, those last verses, and it talked about the seventh angel pouring out the last bowl, poured out in the air, and the loud voice of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is what? Done or finished. Judgment is over. It's all over with at that point. And so when you come to chapter 17, you find out what's being destroyed. This is what's happened. All this has been poured out, and this is what has been destroyed. So that's what we're dealing with tonight. We understand that the world has been destroyed. We understand that the systems have been destroyed, and here are the systems that have been destroyed. Point number one, the judgment of the great harlot of the great prostitute. Notice verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, John, saying to John, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on the many waters. I will show you what has happened. I will show you the judgment that befell the great harlot. Come and let me show it to you. Chapter 16 was the destruction. Chapter 17, this is what was destroyed. The religious system. The what and the who. This is what happened. You get over to chapter 19, Christ's return. Chapter 17 and 18, what has just been destroyed. That's how it happens. So the angel says, come and see, and I will show you what? The harlot. Mark your place. Go to chapter 21 and verse 9. Let me show you just a little, little bit of it. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Who is that? The church. You got that written down? You're very good, Ms. Melton. He says, over in chapter 17, I'm going to show you the harlot. You get to chapter 21, now we're going to see what? I'm going to show you the church. You remember me telling you that the church is still there? You, you go through, you, you get all this left behind series stuff, you get all this premillennial stuff, then you actually go through the book of Revelations and you go from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end and, and you know you never find the church being taken out. You come to chapter 21, 9, the angel says, come on, let me show you the church. Still there. People go back through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they pull out the gospel accounts and they try to say, well, here's where the church comes out. And God is talking about the gospel. He's talking about the good news in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But somehow we try to apply that to Revelation. Eschatology is found in Revelation. And in Revelation it says, you get all the way to chapter 21, the church is still here, let me show it to you. I don't know how we do it. 
I don't know how we take things out of context, but we just love to do it. So he says, notice this. The bride in the church is still there. What I want to show you is the judgment of the harlot. And so you go back to chapter 17, and he says, let me tell you a little bit about it. Point number two, harlot and the cities. Let me show you the harlot cities. It says, with whom the kings of the earth, in verse 2, committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Mark your place and go to Nahum. Now, we know where Nahum is, right? Everybody knows where Nahum is. Nahum, what's after Habakkuk? There you go. If y'all don't know, you need to sit on the front row with Ms. Melanie. She'll help you. Okay? Nahum chapter 3. Nahum's one of those books. Not long, but it's loaded up with stuff. You come to Nahum chapter 3 and verse 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. So here are some of the harlot cities being described. There are certain things about the harlot cities. There are certain characteristics. And all these cities like that will have these characteristics. They get that way because they have some kind of dignity about them. There's some kind of splendor that goes with them. There's some kind of prosperity that moves them to think they're better than everyone else and they fall into this trap. They have an overabundance. They have luxury. They have power. But the one thing they all will have is violence. Woe to the bloody city. Then you look at verse 4. Because of the multitude of the hollow trees, of the seductive harlot, the mystery of sorceries, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her holotries and families through her sorceries. She lures in the trap, pulls people into the trap. And people go willingly, willingly, we fall into the traps. So the angel says, come and see. Look at the cities. Look at the characteristics Notice what they're about. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 21. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in it. You remember the violence? But now murderers. All the harlot cities will have violence in them. And so I began to think, well, surely we don't have a lot of cities like that. How many cities in the United States are full of violence? I mean, we're here in Meridian, Mississippi. We don't have violence in our city in Meridian, do we? They wouldn't ride by the hospital and shoot up in the hospital, would they? You wouldn't find dead people in a canal in in Meridian, Mississippi, would you? I, I mean, surely not here in Meridian, Mississippi. We're a small town. Now, I, I wouldn't even believe the state capital of the Bible Belt, you know, Jackson, Mississippi, it wouldn't have any violence in it, would it? Y'all safe in Jackson, Mississippi? We live in a nation that has prostituted itself. You watch the news. Fake news or not, they'll show enough violence in the cities to let you know we live in a prostituted nation. What about the world? All you have to do is is just watch the news and they'll show you cutting people's heads off over religion. Isn't that correct? You can watch on, on, the, on the internet 
people taking knives and cutting people's heads off in the name of God. The great prostitute. Religion. World religion. We're all trying to get to the same place. And it's all based on violence. Look at the next point. Where does the harlot get her authority becomes the question. Go back and look at verse 1. It says, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits. I remember reading that. and I, You know that word sits, especially during the time of the writing of the scriptures. Sitting is a sign of authority. You go all the way back to Ruth and Ruth and Boaz and and Boaz wanted to to get Ruth as his wife and he went to the city gate and you know who sat at the city gate? The elders that judged. And, And you know what Jesus is doing? He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And so in the writing of the scriptures, the word sitting denotes Authority. Jesus has authority because he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And kings sit upon their throne. And so when you read this, you read the end of that verse. It, well, just read it with me again. It says, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. She has authority. This religious system has great authority Because she sits. Notice also on many waters. City denotes authority. Powerful cities are located on rivers or sources of water. Great cities need water. Uh, You talk about Babylon, which is mentioned in verse 5. Babylon is built on which river? The, somebody say it for me. Which one, Sam? Euphrates River, is that correct? The Euphrates River, right? Great cities grow up on Rome on a river, London on a river, Paris on a river. I I mean Vicksburg, Mississippi on a river, right? That's where the big cities begin to grow up. And so you have this authority, and the cities are great, and it talks about the kingdoms, and so the authority comes from the sitting and the authority comes from the other kings and everything begins to gather together and God is saying, listen, it is a false system that has been destroyed, one that had great authority and one that people came to to worship. Powerful cities. Notice the alliance of the harlots. In verse 2, with whom kings of the earth committed fornication. Immorality. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Kings of the earth. Notice the fourth point, the alliance of the harlot. Kings of the earth were influenced by this false religion. And I I began to wonder, does that actually happen today? I watched on the news during Mardi Gras. Ash Wednesday. Y- y'all know what I'm talking about, Ash Wednesday. Uh, I'm not Catholic, okay? Went to New Orleans Seminary. Uh, if you've been to New Orleans during Mardi Gras, what do people wear on Wednesday? What are they right here? D- did y'all notice there were certain of our Congress ladies that had put the ashes on the forehead in Washington, D.C. Did y'all notice that? Do you know who they were? Who? Nancy who? You mean the woman that's killing babies, the boat to kill babies, was putting ashes on her forehead. Did y'all notice that? All these ladies that claim to be Catholics 
that were voting to kill babies decided they needed to be religious. And they're caught up in that system. And when it came time for Ash Wednesday, they put the ashes on the forehead. Something wrong, isn't it? It's all about religion and influence. It's not about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so when you get to Revelation, the battle is over and he's saying, this is what's been destroyed. It's coming. And they don't realize it. They think they win. But when you get to chapter 17, and that angel says, come let me show you what we've destroyed. Those type of people are the ones that are destroyed. And the unbelievers, those that are dwelling on the earth without Christ, they are destroyed as well. You know the problem with that is we bear guilt for not sharing the gospel to win their soul. To win their soul. Then notice this. I want you to see this as well. I want you to get a good picture of the woman in verses 3 and 4. So he carried me away. The angel carried John away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on the scarlet beast, which was full of names, not just any names. Don't think this is the church, but these names of blasphemy, having seven heads, perfect blasphemy, and ten horns, perfect power, false religion, false government, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Power, governmental power, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. The Spirit carried him away, carried him over there to see this woman, this false religious system that, is, that has been destroyed. And what were they doing? Verse 6. And I saw the woman, and the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The system was killing the saints. You remember back in chapter 9 when it said, I know you're crying out for vengeance, but wait on the altar table because there's some more saints that have to die. She's killing them. The false system is killing them. And when I saw her, John says, I marveled with great amazement. A false system attacking Christ and here's what's so amazing, that false system is popular. It's popular. It's what everybody wants to do. It's what everybody thinks is the thing. Everybody wants to be a part of this false movement. Bible study is not enough. Getting down on your knees and humbling and praying to Christ for your church and for your nation not enough. There's got to be something different. There's got to be something new. You see, the word is just not good enough anymore. And you know what they're killing? They're trying to kill the truth. But you know what they can't kill? The truth. For the truth shall prevail. And I'm going to stop right there.